Welcome back to CCTV's News Bulletin with today elementary themes like time and in our interview the question how to define essential use. Furthermore, a statement on the analysis of alternatives, but first Roger Battersby with interesting topics from yesterday's sessions on the chemical strategy for sustainability. We had two very interesting um, presenta presentation sessions today um, on the chemicals um, sustainability uh, strategy by the European Commission. Um, we had um, an emphasis on the goals and the ambitions and uh, industry views um, um, highlighting some of the uh, problems with that. Um, there were uh, very interesting talks on enforcement and uh, the magnitude of the problem of uh, monitoring um, um, imports for uh, hazardous um, substances. And in the second, presentation, uh, second group of presentations we had um, um, a controversial issue, uh, the mixed assessment factors, uh, which also sparked a lot of um, attention during the final um, question and answer sessions. Um, the final topic um, of the uh, work was uh, safe and sustainability, uh, safe and sustainable by design uh, initiatives by the Commission, uh, which is obviously something which is still under, under development. So to look forward uh, in the future on uh, information on that. The chemical strategy for sustainability can be seen as a new turning point in the European chemical control regulation. In many ways we live in a time where important changes take place that affect the future of all of us. The clock is ticking and time is running out. But how do we measure time? A great place to explore this is Greenwich. I've asked the local reporters to go there and have a good time while exploring time. Hi there, what is the ship behind you? It is the iconic Cutty Sark. Britain's most famous and only surviving tea clipper. It was built in Scotland in 1869 and set sail on her first commercial voyage to China in 1870, loaded with beers, spirits and wines. Once unloaded in Shanghai, the hold was then repacked with tea for London, hence tea clipper. Tea clippers were designed to hold as many chests of Chinese tea as possible. Every inch of space was tightly filled with 300 pound wooden chests of tea. Here in Greenwich, we're not far from where tea clippers once brought cargo into the warehouses of the East India Company, crew longing for adventure and sailing around the globe for years. When sailing on the Kutisak, how do you measure time? Time in a year. Isn't that from Rent the Musical? 525,600 minutes. 525,000 moments so deep. 525,600 minutes, how do you measure a year in the life? In cups of coffee or probably tea, I guess, but uh, how did they measure time? Ships at that time had a marine chronometer, a precision timepiece used to determine the ship's position by celestial navigation, using the sun, moon, stars, etc. It was used to determine longitude by comparing GMT, yes, Greenwich Mean Time, and time at the current location. When they were docked here in London, they could synchronise what's in the name, the chronometer, by looking up to the Royal Observatory. The bright red time ball on top of Flamsteed House is one of the world's earliest public time signals. Normally each day at 12.55pm, the time ball rises halfway up its mast. At 12.58pm, it rises all the way to the top. At 1 o'clock p.m., Greenwich Mean Time, in winter, exactly, the ball falls so provides a signal to anyone who happens to be looking. Thanks for teaching us about the time ball, which has already been in use since the British Imperial century. Talking about the British Empire, did you know Prime Minister Boris Johnson just announced the return of imperial measurements? On top of speed limits being in miles per hour and beers and pints, we can finally forego prices in grams and kilograms, and once again price goods in pounds and ounces. Talking about Boris, tonight we organize our party, our social event. You're also invited, but good luck finding out where it is. Now it's time for an interview on essential use, with a cartoon that, among others, shows a pizza delivery. Could both of you sketch an example of a substance or a group of substances that showcases the complexity of the essential use discussion? I can take, well, two examples maybe. First of all, we look at chromium-6. 
if I look at Chromium 6, the subject authorization and the whole idea of the authorization application of Chromium 6, that was also a bit, let's say, the trigger to start rethinking and, and, and initiating the reform of authorization restriction because many applications have been submitted. So for me, it was like how we, I mean, for such a chemical that has so many broad uses, how would you apply this concept? Would you apply the concept and, and to what extent? And then you get this, this, this debate like if you use Chromium 6 to give uh, water taps a shiny look, is that an essential use or not? Yeah? I mean, these are the debates we will be facing. Um, another example that comes across my mind is microplastics. I remember I was in, um, I was in the discussion with on microplastics in, 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 in ECA and RAC SEAC, where we have very long debates on the use of microplastics in um, as infill material for sport pitches. Yeah? How are we going to take that one forward within the central use debate? Is it essential or not? If you take a very strict application of essential use, you might say there, is so, there are some alternatives, much more costly, but okay, there are alternatives. And do we really need to use these artificial sport pitches for society? I mean, and that just shows who is going to take this decision. And if you ask 10 people, you might get the 11 different answers. So, that's just one example, a few examples to show, I mean, how difficult it can be. Okay, can I have another example on your side, Sylvain? Yeah, perhaps not an example, because what we believe is that if we move toward the application of uh, uh, essential uses, focusing on the function of, a, of the use of a substance, I think uh, substances have not different type of, of uses. Uh, for example, pigment have very specific uses. So do we need that pigment in consumer product? Just to have a beautiful color, I would say that perhaps it's not essential to have a carcinogen pigment in consumer product. So perhaps by focusing on, on, the, on the function of a substance in different uses, we will simplify the concept and it will perhaps at the end it will not be co as complex as expected. Please watch the complete interview with Sylvain and Stefan on our website or YouTube channel. If you want to know if your use is essential, part of your homework will be making an analysis of alternatives. Someone who can help you there is Julius Waller of EPA. If you want to know if a use is essential, part of your homework will be making analysis of alternatives. Someone who can help you there is Julius Waller of EPA. Julius, what are the challenges when making an analysis of alternatives? Well, the problem here is we live in a big world and the internet will show you that people have alternatives for everything. Uh, and so it's quite a saga to have to write an analysis of alternatives these days. And your statement is? Well, I was joking when I said saga. It's not an Icelandic saga, it's the Commission's saga substitute alternatives generally available. And my statements would be, Saga generally aren't, but proving it is a different matter. Julius, thank you very much. Before we finalize with the forecast, let's see if our local reporters, let's call them Sherlock and Watson, have already found the location of the social event. Hi there, I see you're on Baker Street. Yes, Sherlock and I are on Baker Street, standing in front of this splendid four-story Georgian townhouse dating back to 1815 and now serves as a Sherlock Holmes museum. The museum opened its iconic doors in 1990 and now attracts thousands of visitors from all over the world making the pilgrimage to the home of the famous Sherlock Holmes. Dear sir, how do we find the location of the social event? Normally we leave some hints in our Camp TV Wednesday bulletin. Little hints. To a great mind, nothing is little. You don't have to solve this mystery, only if you want to join us tonight. I would say no man would obviously burden himself with such a small matter. But with such a social event as ChemCon Conference, it's elementary. Don't you think, do you want some? You just might take a wild guess. I don't guess. I observe. Once I observe, I deduce. Okay. Maybe some observations from previous hints can be useful. In Budapest, I told Tibor we cross the bridge when we get there. And the social event was in an old bathhouse, in this case, across the bridge. In Philadelphia, I told Benjamin Franklin that I could not disclose the secret, but I expected him to understand since he was a grandmaster of secrets himself. This social event was in the Masonic Temple of Philadelphia, so a temple well known to Mr. Franklin. It's an obvious fruit. There's nothing more deceptive than this fact. Don't you think, Mr. Watson? I hope to see the two of you tonight. Make it a crusade. Let's see if you're indeed world's greatest detective. To be or not to be, that's the question. Or to quote Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, some are born great, others achieve greatness. I got a feeling it's gonna come true, coming to me. Could it be? Yes, 
Yes, it could. Something's coming, something good. But it is gonna be great. Let's find out. You will tonight, if you find it. Hey, thanks for the song from West Side Story. Now let's focus on today's program in the forecast of the day. In the morning, our focus is authorization and restriction, both theory and practice as it is today, as well as the proposed reform scenarios for authorization and restriction. In the afternoon, we continue with restriction developments of PFAS in Europe, North America and the Asia Pacific. Also in this session, more on essential use. Thank you for watching and for those in London, enjoy the sightseeing and looking forward to seeing you at tonight's social event.